Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now I can change glasses. These look a little better, I think. They don't have blue. But uh, chapter 9, and uh, we are continuing through the epistle of 2 Corinthians to the uh, church at Corinth. The Apostle Paul has dealt with giving in chapter 8. That's been the thrust of of his uh, message is the importance of giving and laying aside uh, the first of the uh, week, those things that God has blessed us with, and then to give, and that giving is to be done in and through the Lord's church. Uh, all glory God receives through his local assembly, and uh, so he wants us to give and do his work through his local church, and that's uh, what we do. Chapter 9, he says, he's going to deal now with uh, the relationship of ministers and uh, what people expect of ministers and what uh, ministers are worthy of and support. And uh, he talks about uh, a lot of important issues addressing that. Verse 1, for is touching the ministering to the saints, it is super, superfluous for me to write to you. Uh, meaning that this was something that they understood and it would be going overboard. It would be, you know, not wanting to go above and beyond what was normal as touching the ministering to the saints because, of course, the church at Corinth was uh, a church that gave and uh, uh, it was a church that was much uh, maligned because of different things but Paul knew that they were faithful people so he says it is superfluous for me to write to you for I know the forwardness of your mind for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Remember, they had given out of their deep poverty. And uh, I'm in First, Second Corinthians chapter 9. I think I said that four times, didn't I? <laughs> oh, okay. Second Corinthians chapter 9. I apologize. Verse 3, Yet have I sent the brethren, <clears throat> lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared. In other words, he wanted them to be ready so that they uh, could take care of the needs and necessities of the saints. We that we say not ye should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand <clears throat> your bounty whereof ye had notice before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. So this would be a blessing, a gift uh, to help, and it would not be looked upon as something that would be uh, something they were coveting for or wanting. Uh, if we covet anything, then of course we're wrong because uh, the Bible teaches us not to covet. First time I was aware of covetousness, uh, I went to stay all night with a, a young man whose dad was a Baptist minister. And whenever, you know, we'd drive down a road and we'd see something, I would say, boy, I'd like to have one of those. And he'd say, no, you shouldn't say that. You ought to say, I'd like to have one like that. And I'd say, okay, why is that? He said, because you don't want to covet for that 
you just like to have one like it maybe. I said, okay, I understand. So, And then he read some in the Bible to me that showed me that. But after I got saved, I realized that, you know, covetousness is found throughout the Word of God. Even in the Ten Commandments, uh, they, uh, the Lord encouraged them not to covet after their neighbor's house or their animals or their wives or anything they possessed. But they were to be thankful for what they possessed. And so now, this is the idea. Uh, verse 6 says, <clears throat> But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. That's a universal principle. You know if you're going to uh, grow a garden, you go out and you plant seed, and the more seed you plant, the more return you get on it. The same is true in life. Uh, the more that we give, the more that we do to help others, the more that we do to honor God, the more that's going to come back uh, in our lives, and uh, the more we will be, be blessed. Every man according to as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. We talked about that a little bit last time, about being a giver, a hilarious giver, a cheerful giver, someone that rejoices in giving. If you cannot give to God, and rejoice about it, then you're probably better off keeping what you've got because our, our giving should be done out of a joyful heart. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So here we have the idea that a person that ministers bread for you, or someone who gives seed to be sown, in either case, you are producing something that is a blessing and a help and called fruits of your righteousness. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God, whiles by the experiment of this manifestation they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Now to set the context of this as he talks about giving, he talks about the fact that God is the foundation for all giving. Because of God's gift, I mean, every moment that we live in life, you know, there, there's the brain function, there's the function of the heart, there's the function of the eyes, the lungs. I mean, there are so many things that, has, that must work for us to just be alive. And then we go out into the world and we see the beautiful clouds and the sun and the stars at night, and you hear the water running through the creek, you see all the creatures of God's creation, 
All of these things are blessings from God. Now, there are some things that are not blessings, you know, like mosquitoes, and venomous snakes, and uh, I guess uh, wild animals that could hurt you, but those are all a part of a cursed world. Remember, we don't live in a utopian world because the earth has fallen since the fall of Adam brought about uh, total depravity. And uh, if you want to understand grace, start with total depravity. Uh, this is why we, we believe that if you want to understand the doctrines of grace, you start systematically with where we are. And that's we're depraved. We're, without God, we have no righteousness. We're lost and undone from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. We're corrupt. And uh, our motives, I was praying this morning when I was coming to Sunday school, and I was praying about my motives, uh, about uh, the desires of my heart, because if you're not careful, your motives will deceive you, and you'll be doing things not to glorify God, but for other reasons. So man is totally depraved, and God chooses us completely unconditionally, uh, not based upon foreseen faith, but because of His grace. Uh, and this is what we call unconditional election, special redemption, whatever you want to call it. And then we believe He, he died for His people uh, in the limited atonement and that His his sacrifice could have covered the sins of 15 universes, but he died for a people in particular. And so we talk about uh, the, the atonement, special redemption, limited atonement, that Christ died for his people. Now, we don't know who they are. We preach the gospel to every creature, and we persuade men to come to Christ. But it is God that worketh in them both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And then irresistible grace is where you naturally, logically fall to next. That if God is dealing with your heart and calling you, he calls you uh, not in a general way, but he calls you in a specific way. Uh, the effectual call uh, is when the Holy Spirit sends out that call and you come to Christ that's the work of grace and then the fifth and last one being uh, the uh, perseverance and the preservation of the saints I believe those two go together naturally to understand them properly if we just deal with preser preservation uh, we forget about the human responsibility part of perseverance, that we have a responsibility to put forth an effort and to do what God has called us to do because God is the grounds of all giving. And because God has given so much, we are able to give in return of our lives, of uh, our money, of uh, our prayers, whatever it may be, thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Um, we call this the, the five doctrines of grace, or uh, some call it tulip, uh, but we don't believe them because Calvin wrote them. We believe them because the Apostle Paul and Jesus wrote them as well as the writers of the Old Testament wrote them. And so they're true today, and they'll be true until the Lord returns again. Uh, we, uh, I, I went by, was driving out in the community doing uh, some visiting, and uh, there was a church. It said Reform Baptist, and they had some writing underneath their sign. I stopped to read it, and... Uh, said that they were reformed in that they uh, preached uh, 
the doctrines of grace and some of the other things. And I thought, why in the world did they want to reform something that Baptists have been doing uh, from the time of Christ? True Baptists have been preaching salvation by grace. Now, some people don't understand the doctrines of grace. Uh, when I was a pastor at South Irvin, we had some... We had several brothers that were missionaries, and Brother Roy Humble was a wonderful missionary, but he could not understand the etymology of the doctrines of grace. Uh, he believed in total depravity, and he believed in election, but when you would start trying to break it down for him, uh, he, would, he would say, well, but you got to believe I said, yes, you believe because he works in you. And I would try to explain it to him. It's about like Brother Ross Range. I love Brother Range, respected him much, but he didn't understand the doctrines of grace. And many people at Ashland Avenue Baptist Church don't understand the doctrines of grace. I had a conversation with a deacon in the church, and he come out and asked me about a preacher they were having preached for him. And I said, well, that man don't believe the doctrines of grace. He said, well, I don't either. <laughs> and I said, well, I guess that's the kind of preacher you want. Then go ahead and call him because he don't believe the doctrines of grace, but we do. Uh, now, that don't mean that we don't believe in the responsibility of man. We believe that the gospel is to be preached. We support missionaries who preach the gospel. We believe in witnessing. We believe in doing everything we can to get the message out. But we don't try to talk people down the aisle or talk people into decisions or get them to hold up their hand or to pressure them in to coming forward. We leave that to God. We tell them what they should do, but only God can work that in the heart. So God is the fountain of all good blessings. I hope all of our young people understand TULIP total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance, and preservation of the saints. The five uh, parts of TULIP. Uh, Amber uh, had a college course as a freshman at Eastern, and uh, it was a religion course, and one of the teachers said, uh, now, you all probably never heard of TULIP. And Amber raised her hand and just, you know, rattled off all five of the doctrines of grace. And she said the teacher was just, wow. You know, he didn't even know that. He just knew about TULIP. And, you know, children need to understand these things. We need to teach them the Word of God so they can grow and mature because when they get in college, and they start uh, trying to create doubt in their minds. We need to teach them about creation and all the facts concerning God so that they can grow. Now Paul goes on, and we're going to try to cover the next chapter. He says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in, in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. Uh, I recommended, Kathy and I went to see uh, the Apostle uh, Paul, the Apostle of Christ, and I recommended it. It had no bad language. They took some liberties that, that you know, the Bible doesn't teach, but could be some historical precedents for it. But uh, anyway, in that uh, film, it showed Paul being a, uh, kind of a tall fella, maybe 5, 10, or 11. But uh, history says Paul was short and that he was kind of chubby, uh, that he was bald, and uh, that he, he did not have a strong speaking voice, that his voice was kind of timid. Uh, and so here Paul admits, he says that when I was among you, uh, I was there in meekness and gentleness, who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold toward you. I mean, he could write. And my, how God used him and inspired him to write the epistles 
uh, of the Apostle Paul. He goes on and he says, uh, But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. There were some that were making accusations against Paul, and even in that movie uh, showed some of the different people that, you know, they didn't understand. People still don't understand. When you love people and help people, they think you're taking advantage of them. You know, they think, well, he's given me that so that he can get something back. That's the way people think. But when you love God and you just give to help people, to show love, that honors God and shows the love of Christ. And that's the way we ought to give. But many said that Paul wasn't doing that. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now we have to be very careful. Our battle is not in the flesh of this world. Uh, in Ephesians 6, he talks about the, the armor of God and he says we take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we battle not against flesh and blood. I, I love what David said when he went out to battle Goliath. He told Goliath that he came to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Goliath was described as this massive Philistine with his huge... Uh, shield and sword and all of his armor and David was this small fellow Rudy red hair most likely freckles and he went out there as a teenage boy 16, 17 and all it says is he had a sling but he came in the name of the Lord God of heaven and he took that sling and uh, with five smooth stones because Goliath had four brothers. And uh, in case he needed the other four, he had four, um, four more. So with that one stone, he brought him down. Then he took his sword, and like a big piece of baloney, he just chopped off his head and held it up for everybody to see. And uh, the armies of Israel fled. Now, even though David was described as being small of stature, he was strong spiritually. We need to be strong spiritually. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Uh, a church was about to split, and one of the men came up to the pastor, and he said, we've got them outnumbered about three people, so we can take the vote and win it. And the pastor looked at him and he said, Brother, we don't, we don't do things that way. We don't battle with the flesh. This is not the way of God. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I've had uh, pastor friends who told their sons-in-laws when they married them, if you ever lay a hand on my daughter, I will come to your house and take my fist and beat every tooth in your head out. And I have even had pastor friends who attempted to do that. <laughs> uh, it was, it was, I mean, you feel like it sometimes if a man mistreats your daughter uh, or your children. You feel like doing it, but you cannot take things into your hands. If you do that and get in the flesh, you're going to get in trouble and you're going to ruin your testimony. We don't fight that way. Uh, we, we make our position known and we try to support those who are in the right and uh, try to, I try to stay out of my children's lives. I don't want to try and be somebody that's always meddling because... You know, two people need to be able to make their own decisions. When they get married, they have to stand on their own two feet, make a living, try to get by. So let them alone and try to encourage them. Paul goes on and says, Casting down imaginations 
and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's one of the most difficult things that you'll ever have to do in your life. And I pray that you're all attempting to do this. Uh, if you let your imagination <clears throat> run wild with you, it will take you into places where you don't need to go. Uh, I've, I've, uh, when I was in college, I remember some young men you know, who talked about, they'd say, well, it doesn't really matter about your thought life. You can think about things as long as you don't do it. And uh, I told him, I said, well, if you start thinking about something and you think about it long enough, it won't be long until you'll be doing part of it. So put it out of your mind. Cast down your imaginations. Because, you see, Satan works through our flesh. And he will put things into our mind to make us think that this would be a grand adventure to do this but it would be a terrible thing in reality. And then he says, uh, bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, do you look on things after the outward appearance uh, if any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed." that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letter. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. The Apostle Paul, uh, according to tradition, had terrible migraine headaches. And uh, he would stop as he traveled along and he would look for springs of cold water. And he would get out and he would sink his head into cold water to try and numb the pain of his severe headaches. Some tie that in with his eyes because he had trouble with his vision. And that could have brought on some of the migraine headaches. But uh, nevertheless, Paul makes reference to these weaknesses that he had uh, even his speech saying it was contemptible. Let such and one think this, that such as we are in word by letter when we are absent, such will we be also in deed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Who do we compare ourselves to? Christ. We don't compare ourselves against each other. We're all sinners saved by grace. We're not envious of one another. Whatever gifts God's given you, thank God for that and rejoice in that. And... Uh, Always exalt your brother and your sister. Never put another man's wife down. We love our wives, but our wives are our blessing, and we should not pit our wife against another man's wife and say, well, I got the greatest wife in the world. My wife's greater than your wife. Those things are childish and immature, but many people do it. Uh, one, of the, one of the worst things that a friend can do is to try and make himself superior and not be a true friend and humble himself and serve you and love you. And this is a, a lot about what Paul is dealing with. But we will not boast of anything with, without any measure, but according to the measure 
of the rule which God hath distributed to us a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you, for we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Not boasting of things without our measure, that is of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by your, you according to our rule abundantly to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. Whenever they talked about people being saved, they gave credit to God. They didn't give credit to the preacher. One of the things that I've seen in the past is people giving credit to preachers like preachers were the one that, you know, got somebody saved. We have this evangelist because, boy, he gets people saved. How foolish that is and uh, how immature because it's God who saves but he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. <clears throat> oh, how we need to remember that. Amen. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. You know, we have many, many decisions that we have to make in our, in our Christian life. We start out uh, serving the Lord. And uh, when the Lord saves us, uh, we begin to search for the truth. <clears throat> and then we determine that we're going to become a Baptist and we're going to follow the Lord. We, we believe in eternal security. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. You know, we believe the King James Version is the best translation. And we, we make decisions all the time that we have to answer for and some will condemn us, and uh, maybe others will commend us. But regardless of what may occur, if there's any success, we give God the glory. If anybody's convinced of anything, it's because God worked in your heart 